KSHK Shiono and you are listening to Pixelated Audio. to the video game music and retro gaming podcast pixelated audio i'm james and this is brian how's it going everyone today we're going to be playing music and talking about a game called neural gear for the sharp x68000 really excited this is a, an excellent soundtrack very good soundtrack yeah and we have a chance to talk to the composer soon mm-hmm. so um that's whenever we have you know a composer come on and kind of chat about their history and their composition background that's always a lot of fun so oh, i'm, I'm yeah. excited it's really it's always so much fun to hear straight from the composer's mouth like you know we always find all these cool little tidbits we don't know what yeah. we're going to find out by talking to them maybe a little bit about the company or you know like the work environment or something i don't know so we'll just have to wait and see yeah it's it's kind of funny because we had planned to get this episode out on time mm-hmm. but then you know, um, I was chatting with um, Jon Alsan, the composer of this game, and he's like, oh yeah, sure, I'll be on, but I don't really have time, you know, mm-hmm. for another, you know, week or so. So we had to kind of push it out. And since we're not so strict on our, our dates and our deadlines, it's making it a lot easier to get composers to come on right. and uh, be able to share their thoughts in, you know, at their convenience. Yeah, because so. we had we had an episode a long time ago with uh, Journey to Silius where... Oh, Naoki uh, Kodaka. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. agreed to be on the show, but... We had already had the episode done and ready. So and it was already out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now we have this real laid back schedule. So when things like this come up, you know, we don't see it being a bad to push it out for a few days to get something extra onto it. Yeah. But the soundtrack's a lot of fun to listen to. Uh, recently did a rip for VGM Rip. So mm-hmm. that should be coming out about the time this episode comes out. So very soon. Otherwise, you can download the pack in the submission form. But very, very cool thing about the soundtrack is that it not only had a full FM soundtrack, it also included a full MIDI soundtrack. Uh, it was designed for the MT32, but uh, we're going to be focusing on the FM a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. We love FM, so the focus is going to be there. And like you said, those comparisons, I always love comparing uh, the different kinds of tracks, it, whether it's from different systems or you know different setups. So, But the track that brought us in today was the opening track from the game from the OPM sound source titled What You Change, composed by Keishi Yonao. Uh, this track is uh it has a very like action sequence movie build up you mm-hmm. know where the um like the title screen is just coming in and this is the title screen of the game so it it, it works it's a very good kind of opening get all the the blood flowing and then mm-hmm. you know settle you into this title screen before you get you know headed on to the journey yeah it's moody and it has a, a slower build to the beginning but it's really cool at at the start it has a little bit of subtle stereo stuff going on and that builds to get more complex later on in the the track which is always nice that you know you spend some time listening and if it doesn't really go any place then you kind of get bored of listening to it so uh, this would be a game where if I had the ability to play it as a kid when it came out I would be like just sitting on that tile screen just listening to where this journey goes and and uh, I really loved how this track had like a dedicated ending to it as yeah, well it wasn't just yeah. like oh let's fade into a loop um, but it was it was really cool and uh, even though the track is kind of moody and kind of you know mellow it has like this this uh, drama to it uh, that bass in the background really gets going sometimes. Yeah, you know, I think Yonaus on his um, use of bass is incredible throughout the soundtrack, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of kind of slap FM mm-hmm. bass going on in there. But then he mellows it out and then changes stuff up, and there's we're gonna see a lot of dynamic. Uh, bass use, I think, as we kind of go through the soundtrack and yeah. listen to these songs, you know, kind of back to back. So I'm um, kind of excited to go through that with you. And we'll kind of solo them out when we get to some of the, the really interesting ones that might be kind of buried and we can kind of like listen to that and discover together. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah. And like, like other episodes, this is a game that has an amazing soundtrack and it's a 
it's a game that probably got passed over by many, many, many yeah. people. So yeah. uh, it's always great to bring something like that. Plus, Sharp X68000, this is, you, yeah. you know, yeah. we don't really focus on that very often. So Yeah, I mean, we have tracks in the expansion packs and stuff, but we don't do, I think the last full X68000 episode we did was like, was that Granada? Was it that yeah, and that was Genesis as well, I think. Oh, yeah, right, so right, So it wasn't right. A, a solo, but it, it did have a good focus. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about this game a little bit. Neurogear was developed by Filling Cafe and published by Cross Media Soft. It's a third-person rail shooter, very similar to Space Harrier. Yeah, very similar. Yeah, released for the Sharp X68000 exclusively on two 5-inch floppy disks in November of 1990. And uh, it was sold for about 90 bucks. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, we talk about games being expensive now. I mean... Uh, some collector's editions of games are not $90. Yeah, don't copy that floppy because they need their $90. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe that was the slogan and a little sticker on there that says, don't copy this floppy. Yeah, so um, the publisher, Cross Media Soft, we haven't really talked about them yet on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, just a little bit about them. They were a small publishing group run by Victor Musical Industries from 1983 to 1991, and they were responsible for new media being game software. Mm -hmm. The role was focusing on the computer software side of things, whereas the main Victor brand or pack in video, which was a joint venture between Victor and Tokyo broadcasting, basically a subsidiary. They were more focused on MSX and stuff like that over the consoles. Right. So cross media stuff, they produced about 10 or so titles and a handful of those being ports, nothing really groundbreaking. We didn't see their, their logos pop up too much. Uh, yeah. Definitely not here in the States. So, you know, I guess they will be missed by some, <laughs> by some, Anyway, the developer, uh, Fill In Cafe, was a relatively small Japanese game developer, best known for the Asuka 120% Burning Fest game, which is a fighting game series that began in 1994. Originally, when the company was founded in 1987, they were called Team Cross Wonder and developed a title almost a predecessor to Neural Gear because it was very similar in gameplay, called Metal Sight for the X68000, but later changed the company name to Fill In Cafe in 1989, with Neural Gear being the first title under this new name. Uh, they totaled about 50 titles or so, some of them being ports, and worked on a ton of different systems. Like, oh, yeah, like there, there's a, a ton of different yeah, systems they work on. Yeah. For a small company, they had quite the variety. They there was 3DO, PC Engine, Arcade, X68000, FM Towns, PCFX, PC98, Super Famicom, PlayStation, and Saturn. You know, for a small team, you know, we kind of think like, oh, you know, they just ported all these games or whatever to right. other platforms. But, you know, not all these processors were the same. And a lot of the dev kits had very different mm -hmm. um, ways that you had to compile your, your applications and stuff for. So, like, for one team, a small team to take this on... That's a that's a lot of work, man. That's right. a lot of work. Yeah, you know, I mean, we I can talked about handle, I can barely handle like two platforms, you know, compiling <laughs> yeah. for. But I mean, we talked in other episodes where games had you know like a Genesis port and from the N the SNES or vice versa, and just that alone was like two totally different processes, and it was like uh, you know really difficult for small teams to handle like basically relearning how to make the game they already made. Right, right. Anyways, though, uh, even with the success of Oscar one twenty percent. And also titles like Mad Stalker, the company ended up filing for bankruptcy in 1998 and had to cancel off some of their projects. When the company closed, FamilySoft ended up buying most of the rights to their developed titles, and a few of the employees moved over to Treasure and other startups too. Right. So it's not like when they went under, like nobody ever heard from these guys again. They kind of moved on to different things, yeah. you know. And this happens like all the time. I mean. It's like a cesspool of like video game developers mm -hmm. over in Japan in the, in the late incest. 80s, early 90s. Yeah, <laughs> they're just kind of moving over to wherever the money was, I, th I guess. Yeah, and it's always great to hear when a company goes down, some guys, you know, join together and create all these new companies or, you know, melt into other other places. Uh, so they're never really gone for good. Never really gone. They're always just kind of lingering in, in, in an other name. Yeah. That's all. But it does seem like the 90s and the early 2000s were extremely difficult for these small companies. Like if you could, if you got past that it seemed like you would probably if you could be okay make it, if you could make it past like 2005 yeah or if you or 2001 maybe like i think you're okay yeah it was a it must have been a very rough time it was a rough startups. ride <laughs> anyways let's get into some music we've got a track called townscape from neural gear on the sharp x68000 composed by kashiyam now
All right, so that was Townscape or Toshi in Japanese, composed by Keishi Yonao for Neural Gear on the Sharp X68000. Wow, what a track! That was super cool. I love right from the start that like really heavy, that heavy forceful beat. Uh, but it was real, you know, real slow. The the beat was real slow, and it's, everything's going all crazy. And just such a great track. I yeah, really the, enjoyed it. This is like a like a street beat, like a I guess kind of like this this diehard kind of feel to it. It's mm-hmm. like the the bass is like it's funky and but kind of subdued and subtle in the background. You got these really kind of like twinkly kind of uh, almost like dark and dangerous kind of notes at the top mm-hmm. end and uh, I don't know there's nothing about this track that just doesn't scream badassery yeah it's just really it's really awesome yeah and there was parts of the track that I thought were very kind of bright and fun and uh, like a very encouraging and it gave me this feeling of like maybe exploring like a new city or something like wow look at that over there and look at that over there and yeah. but there was like <laughs> this uh, this like uh, dangerousness that kind of creeped in or this like, urgency and like, I thought it was I, really cool yeah like I, what you're saying you know there are that that part uh, those parts where it's like da 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 and you kind of got this uh, a little bit brighter feeling and then it like it, it brings you right back into that like kind of dark and dangerous yeah. you know it kind of it's, hooks you back in yeah it's like you're walking through the city and then you turn down the wrong street and you're like oh no <laughs> yeah uh, do you want to hear another track yeah next we up got? we have a Depletion and we'll be right back You just heard Depletion, or Sogen in Japanese, composed by Keishi Yonao for Neural Gear on the X68000. Yeah, so Sogen in Japanese means grassland. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of like a like this kind of bright green area that you're flying over. And uh, the track has a little bit more positive energy, I want to say. Yeah. It's, it's a little less dark and grimy. It's a little bit more uplifting. And like, uh, you know, the Oki chip playing the, those you know drum samples is just very like they're very in your face yeah uh, especially very... those machine gun drums yeah <laughs> you know and actually that's something i like about his style is that uh, and we hear it in this track is that the the high end the melody never really it's not overpowering the 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 low end and the drum stuff everything's kind of mixed together in fact sometimes the drums are more overpowering than right. the uh, the top end and so you get this kind of sense that you're trying to kind of seek out the uh the, the melody a little bit more. It's almost like kind of this soul searching during his his music mm-hmm. because sometimes his tracks will just really like hint at a melody and they'll they'll kind of like go in the background more where we kind of see that flipped in a lot of other a lot of other music. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, I can definitely see that the kind of like upside down feeling that the track has where uh, you have to kind of you know close your eyes and listen a little bit more to pick up on the melody and to follow it you know while it's weaving in and out and. Um, I, I can definitely see that. I, I didn't think about that until you had mentioned it. Um, there is that amazing, like, synthy guitar solo and like towards the middle of this track. That, like, because I thought this track was good and it was a really solid track. Nothing like you know, to- like super amazing, but a really, really good solid track. And then I heard that that solo and I was just like, whoa. Do you want to do you want to listen to that? Oh yeah. All right, hold on. Let me see if we can find it. Wow, that's. Looks like it's only channel one and two there. Uh, second channel being for the echo on that. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. 
wow, that sounds really good. Yeah, it's crazy. And that little bend towards the end is like, yeah. ooh, it's like a, a nice little signature on the end there. Yeah, no, I dig that. You know, I, I'm, of course, I'm hearing it with you, and it, that stands out to me too, but like really kind of soloing it out and, and mm-hmm. listening to that, you really get to, ooh, yeah, it's one of the, it all. It's like one it. of the great things about being on Solo's channels is we can, you know, pinpoint little oddities or, or cool things that that uh, you know may not be noticeable the first couple times you hear the game. Yeah, the only person who really would have heard it was Casey O'Neill, right, mm-hmm. while he was making it. So, yeah. uh, but let's talk about him for a little bit. Hailing from Fukuoka, Casey O'Neill is highly regarded among game audio enthusiasts for his incredible detail and creativity. He's best known for the Oscar 120 Burning Fest series, Mad Stalker, and Dies Irae, which is like a visual novel right. kind of RPG style game, which he's won a lot of awards for. It's mm-hmm. an amazing soundtrack, and they're actually yeah. turning it into an anime oh wow that's or they, awesome they, or they have turned it into an oh, anime okay. so uh, i think they're like on their second season or something Man, like that visual novels they have amazing soundtracks yeah they do uh his first composition actually started on the msx with a game titled hydephos and from there he joined up with filling cafe to work on a lot of their titles altogether he's done over 30 or so soundtracks and he's also worked uh, with other companies like elf composing some of the music for you know mm-hmm. uh in addition to game audio though he's also composed a cd album series called cyberphonic as well as other compilations like a track called mass purple for 8-bit music power as well uh we talked about this uh before i think masahiro kajihara did a track at one point i can't remember what the track was called but uh yeah it's it's excellent this is a lot yeah. of famous composers kind of came together for this compilation album for oh, yeah. nes music yeah so. i remember when this came out we were just like what yeah, cool. yeah. Ed sent me over his his rip of it, and mm-hmm. I've just listened to that for days. So it was really cool. Yeah. So anyway, let's get into some more music. Next up, we have Systematic Eyes, and we'll be right back. That was Systematic Eyes from Keishi Onao's soundtrack, Neural Gear on the Sharp X68000. In Japanese, this is called Akukan Ichi, or Subspace One is the translation. Uh, not sure where Systematic Eyes came from, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I like it. Yeah, uh, I can. I, the The title gives me this Im, this impression of being more like a computer sounding or less organic. Uh, and I get that from the beginning. It feels very, yeah, it feels very much like a computer program wrote the beginning of the song. And then, you know, the drums come in and more and more and more. And before you know it, I mean, this track is like this flood of sound and it starts feeling more organic, more like, um, human like, I guess, like, or it's it's like impersonating, um, more of a live sound, I guess. But, right. Uh, I really like this track a lot. It was so much to listen to, so much good stuff going on. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of like what this reminds me of. It, it's it's something hits home when I hear this track. Mm-hmm. It, 
something. I kind of had that feeling too, like there was something on the tip of my tongue that it reminded me of, but I couldn't quite place yeah, it. Yeah, like I almost want to say like Ghost in the Shell, but not at all. <laughs> like <laughs> nothing like that. Um, but it yeah, has that like track. cyber feel, that futuristic, right. like uh, high energy, action packed sound. I think this was a time really in Japan too that um, sci fi was becoming really, really like, mm-hmm. you know, like sci-fi and like um, kind of distant utopian future space uh, yeah. was really big in anime you got like a lot tech of tech yeah future stuff. tech and stuff mm-hmm. like that's like all it was well, before it was one a of lot my more, favorite times in anime too right so. right the, a lot of that stuff before was you know really kind of the ronin kind of um uh like samurai old world old world stuff, stuff yeah. you know and like and, the occult like spirits and demons type things right right like right technology yeah but then kind of moving into into this you know kind of time frame i th- i think that that sci-fi that tech sci-fi was really big and the mm-hmm. music couldn't encompass that that feeling any better i right. think it just does an excellent job and you know we've talked about the sharp hardware before the sound hardware mm-hmm. um i think it's it's been a while so it's it's probably not a bad idea for us to just kind of run through it real yeah. quick together i mean i think we talked about it like in the most detail the first time with our one year episode with uh double dragon we covered oh, all those different systems oh, maybe, it was yeah. On, but yeah that's that was a long time ago yeah and then the granada episode i'm sure we covered it then yeah. too so uh for the sharp x68000 it's a really cool piece of hardware it's you know a japanese pc that gained a lot of popularity for its gaming even though it was you know fully capable of doing you know the business side of things right. too more importantly to us though is the audio side it housed a ym2151 which is this glorious eight channel fm synth chip that we've you know again talked about in a lot of greater detail actually you know what we talked about it on um, some of the arcade soundtracks and oh, stuff okay. as well yeah but because it's a pure fm chip it was accompanied or the sharp x68000 was accompanied by an Oki MSM 6258 to deliver the 80 PCM samples, which was the same chip used in the PCFX, if memory serves me correctly, giving it a four bit mono channel at 22 kilohertz sampling rate. So I think we can kind of break it down and you can hear each one of the FM, you know, it's just FM channels. So right. there's not a lot to um, show like the difference, but we can kind of run through it and you can hear each of the samples. So we'll yeah. kind of, we'll start with, you know, uh, maybe the first two channels and work our way down and Mm -hmm. then add the Oka chip at the end. You want to listen to uh, Systematic Eyes since we just played that one? Yeah, I think that would be a a good one since, yeah, we just covered it, so it's fresh in your ears. All right, so let's start with channels one and two, uh, which are the lead, but uh, we can kind of hear that and then see how each channel subsequently adds more character to the track. So again, there's eight channels of FM synth, so we're going to just kind of, I guess, pair them up. I think that's the best way to go. So uh, here is channels one and two. All right, and here's channels three and four. Wow, it's really pan, looking right on that one. All right, and here's five and six. All right, and here is seven and eight. Now it's starting to sound a lot more fledged out, but we really get the, uh, the I guess, the meat uh, of the track from that Oki chip when we add the samples in. So let's let's actually just go ahead and turn off the FM synth or the YM2151 and uh, listen to just the Oki chip by itself for a second. So that's that's the Oki chip. You know, and by itself, you know, it's really only one channel. Mm -hmm. So to be able to create like the bass, kick, you know, hats, snare on one, you really had to do something clever with the sample by actually recording the samples kind of over each other and then mixing it down to one. Kind of like uh, beatboxing and stuff like that, like people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly like that, actually. Ooh. It's it's so so cool to hear the variation into what the two different chips are doing, what they sound like. Like that was very heavy 
like drum kit, so cool. And then the other was very synthy and wild and futuristic. And it's just cool to hear it all. The juxtaposition together. actually, I think, is what makes this tr- track so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, again, the YM2151, which is FM, and then the Oak chip for 80 PCM to give it some extra meat behind it. Most often used for percussion, just right. like you heard. And, you know, those orchids, something, something that's like, you know, very sample based. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of a, a mini breakdown of the sound hardware. Nothing, again, we we'll try to keep it kind of light for this because we got a lot to go through today. Oh, yeah. I mean, in these things, like, if you're not into, the, like, the tech side of everything, it's it becomes, like, a totally different language really quickly. <laughs> yeah. It, when there's something specific we want to talk about, we'll get into the details on that one thing so it's not too overwhelming because I know a lot of people are listening to this because they're curious about composers and about the history. And so we try to do a little balance with the, the tech side, not make it too much because if i'm overwhelming james then i realize i have been not doing my job and keeping <laughs> yeah. It nice yeah, and simple because i've had a couple years of uh, starting to learn this language a little bit but. yeah so i mean you're and you're in the in the upper end the upper range <laughs> yeah. now anyways yeah so that is the uh, the sound hardware on the x68000 yeah now this soundtrack actually saw a release which is really cool i mean it's right. not as surprising for a japanese soundtrack to get released but this was and it has titled neural gear original soundtracks which was released 10 years ago on march 28th of 2008 and this was digitally released only and published by egg music directly to their website you know i went to the website and i was like oh you, you know I'll buy the soundtrack. And sure enough, man, there are so many hoops you have to go through. <laughs> you have to have Yahoo Wallet only. Okay, never is, heard of that. Yahoo Japan, like the Yahoo search engine in Japan is basically like the search engine. It like out does Google. Like that's okay. like their search engine. Um, that's basically their Google over there. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, uh, it, it does their finances. It does everything, their news, everything. It's this huge ecosystem in Japan here. Yahoo's kind of on the dying and right. you don't really hear about Yahoo too much unless it's like a mail account that's spamming you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so you have to have a Japanese, uh, Yahoo Japan, uh, wallet set up and then the, the, um, tracks aren't that expensive. It's like Hyakuen and each was like a buck each mm-hmm. and the whole soundtrack together is about 1200, 1200 yen, which is like 10 bucks. Yeah. So you can buy it all in one shot. Which is a pretty good deal. Yeah. For what? 35 tracks. Yeah. So, and what's awesome is that it contains both the OPM version and the MT32. Yeah. So, so. that is a, that is a great deal to, to get the both versions of the soundtrack and an amazing soundtrack. But yeah, that sounds like a lot of hoops to, uh, yeah. The, the problem is I actually, I was, I was curious if, if Kishi and now actually got any of the money and he's like, I didn't even know there was a soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess, well, I, I guess, you know, you could buy it, but he won't get any of the money for it. Well, I mean, it was released quite a time after the game had been released. So. Oh yeah. It was like 18 years or something afterwards. Yeah. It was so. ridiculous. Yeah. Anyways, let's get into some more music. This is called Vast, also known as The Jungle, composed by Keishio Now for Nero Gear on the Sharp X68000.
heard Vast or Jungle, composed by Keishi Yonao for Neural Gear on the X68000. You know, I keep having trouble saying Neural Gear. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I don't know what it is about that that freight, that combo of words that just is very difficult. Neural to Gear. Neural, neur, neural. <laughs> it just sounds so weird to me. Anyways, I, I keep wanting to say Neutral Gear. Yeah, same here. Or Neuter Gear. Neuter Gear. <laughs> it's it's own Normal Gear. Normal. Uh, no, Vast, great track. Um, this, you know, at first, it, when I first heard it, I, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, it's, it didn't catch me mm-hmm. until right after, he has these different sections, and right after that first section, I want to say, he, he, he kind of morphs the song into something very different than when it started, right. and there's this part that, um, I, I want to play for you in a second, but it just, it feels like there's so many different instruments kind of cutting in like they're kind of like breaking and making like their own little emergence you know mm-hmm. in the middle of the track and you don't really and then they kind of you know duck back down you don't really hear them uh as is i guess strongly in the in the rest of the music but um i i really like this part let me see if uh, you'll know what i'm talking about is that is that breakdown i'll turn off the uh, oak chip and we'll just listen to it that okay way. I picture it is like the the base is like the uh, the fisherman and he's like casting out his his uh you know his line mm-hmm. and like little fish or like little instrument fish are like kind of like biting and then they get away real quick <laughs> he's not he's not quite making it he's trying to keep bringing them in um yeah that wasn't really the best explanation but that, 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 yeah yeah no and I totally know what you mean and and it's funny like so the the two different kind of track titles for this one are vast and jungle and I don't feel like it fits the name like with all the different instruments and all the different sounds they're popping in and out it feels very crowded uh instead of like kind of open and vast and you know very big yeah um and then jungle it doesn't give me like a jungly theme not at all at all all. um but i thought this track was very playful i thought it was really fun um i could see how this track the first couple times you hear it may not really catch your ear too much because it's a lot going on and uh, if you get a minute to kind of listen to it it feels like a, a fun jam session like all these different instruments they're getting their little part to pop right, in and out and right. they're they're really working together it'll be like a couple different sounds to make like one little like like series of of notes it's really cool to i don't know it's it's a really neat song i think um maybe in that aspect it feels kind of jungly where there's a lot going on and you know the different instruments are like different animals that are like popping up on your journey. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, so we talked about the MT32 version mm-hmm. being included in this soundtrack as well. When you boot up the game, you actually have the option. If you have MT32 hardware or MIDI output, you can go through your MT32, your Roland MT32, and get amazing MIDI audio playback. Um, we always kind of prefer the FM, mm-hmm. but there is a big fandom around MIDI music. And we, we do like it. Right. Um, nothing against it. I don't have an MT32, and I would love to get one someday, but um, so I have to rely on uh, others, like friends and stuff that have hardware. Um, mm-hmm. Let's take a quick listen to the same track in MT32 form just to do a little comparison. We'll kind of listen to other tracks as we go through the episode. Yeah. So here's Vast again, or Jungle, uh, through the MT32. <laughs>
yeah so i mean it's it's a it's a good track it, right. you know it's it, it's a little bit more floaty like open amphitheater sounding i mm-hmm. think that's just a little because, more vast <laughs> a little more vast well you know the mt32 hardware has like this um i think it's like a reverb mode where it makes it sound like a grand hall mm-hmm. and so you get a lot of that kind of that echo and reverb in there um but definitely prefer the opm soundtrack yeah i, I think the compare the two it feels the, the second one feels very smooth uh, the first one feels more like a impromptu jam session and uh this one feels like a, a little bit more fine-tuned and like uh like i said like just smoother like it was more planned and and planned out um i still also like the the first version the best but uh i mean if i'd never heard of the other one i'd be like oh this is pretty rad this is pretty rad uh, all right, let's listen to another track from the OPM side. This is called Invite. It's actually an unused track in the game, composed by Casey Now. heard an unused track called Invite from Neurogear on the X68000 composed by Keishi Yonao. Now this track to me has like this really, um, first of all, I don't know why it was unused. It's a really cool track. Yeah. It's short. The loot kind of starts a little bit sooner than you'd want, but um, it's got this really cool kind of waterfall-y feel to it. Like mm-hmm. all the notes are kind of like just toppling over themselves, but in a very like organized systematic eyes way <laughs> yeah uh no it, i like it i really like this track yeah i think this one has a really cool juxtaposition of the extremely high uh, section the very uh, kind of piercing sounds you and the... yeah, yeah yeah and then the uh you know the very deep drums and bass and stuff like that and, and i do like how uh after the the high section has its day in the sun the deep drums and everything get to kind of just take over again and, and give you a break and I, I like this track a lot I, just, I like his balance yeah it, it, having that you, you're talking about you know the high end kind of getting its spotlight and then kind of backing down and then the strong samples and the in the the really you know strong fm bass comes back in and it kind of keeps its presence i like mm-hmm. that balance that he does in a lot of these tracks yeah and one of the cool things about this soundtrack too is we see a lot of times in in songs they'll kind of have a slow build and it'll gradually get you know bigger and bigger and bigger and these ones do the same thing except for they start out so big already like as soon as you turn the song on it's just like boom drums right in your face yeah, and it's really loud bombastic and, yeah and, and you're like wow what's it gonna go from here explosive. and it just keeps going up mm-hmm. and uh, i really like that that it's it feels a little different in that sense and um i appreciate it quite a bit it's really nice yeah so let's talk about neural gear a little bit since mm-hmm. we haven't talked about it at all 
at yeah, this point. Yeah, the story. Yeah, so the story is you play as a pilot, Emmy T. Fonan, uh, in a futuristic post-World War IV world. You're equipped with a flying time-traveling suit, and your mission's to travel back in time, taking out different time-traveling robots. Yeah. There's so a lot of tri- time-traveling going on. <laughs> yeah. But I think you're constantly going backwards. Right. So, yeah. yeah, from what I understood is each level takes place before the previous one. So uh, it's it's interesting. I mean, anything that has to do with time-traveling <laughs> usually back is kind back, of weird. Back. But, yeah, getting like a flying suit, which gives you that... Uh, earlier we said it was kind of like Space Harrier, so you can kind of get that idea that you're uh, like a humanoid figure, you know, like flying through instead of like... It's a lot like Space Harrier. It's yeah. pretty much in every sense of the way, maybe not executed as well as Space Harrier, but... Yeah, but uh, I mean, it's I mean, it's it's an interesting story. I mean, instead of doing World War Three, they we survived World War Three, and now it's like World War Four has already happened. Well, maybe so. it's only robots at that point. Yeah. Uh, one interesting thing about the game is that the programmer and producer of the game, his name was Takumi Amano, he must have really liked Space Harrier because, mm-hmm. or, or the mechanics of Space Harrier anyway, because he's also the programmer for the ports of Night Striker on the PlayStation and Saturn. I think he also did the Sega CD version, but it's another Space Harrier clone. Right. So like, all these kind of three games have a very similar, you know, that that third person kind of flying, you mm-hmm. know, forward kind of feel. And he he's kind of connected to it and all in, in some kind of way. So he must have either been drawn to it or um, maybe it's just a luck of the draw and he just got tasked one doing yeah. that. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, so the health system of this game is actually probably what's really interesting, probably the most unique thing about it, right? Right, about the gameplay and the um, just the way the game works. Uh a lot of games have like a gimmick built around the way the health works, something that is built into the story or reminds you of something. And, right. and this it's one some, is, sometimes it's just as simple as hearts, you know. You get, right. You know, and hearts. sometimes that's actually better. Yeah. Uh, I think this would be one of the cases. Uh, this one you have, uh, it's not really like a health bar of any kind. It's a timer. Uh, of sorts that counts down very, very rapidly. Um, And as you take damage, it kind of knocks off chunks of time. So it acts as your health meter uh, in a very frantic way. But it does give the impression of moving fast and the whole idea of moving backwards through time. So I could see it as like a, a gimmick that was chosen for this style of game yeah you can find like different health pickups and stuff like that to increase that time limit yeah so by killing enemies uh is the way that that works enemies in this game kind of appear on the screen in large clusters and after killing 20 enemies you get 200 points added back to your timer so it's It's like a succession you know it reminds me of like galaga or something you know mm-hmm. or um even our type you know where you get yeah. like uh you get a power up after you know a succession of enemies or something like that. that's the same thing but in a health sense yeah and the way that they help you out with this to keep track of those kills is there is a massive uh kill counter at the bottom of the screen that has uh, the number of kills that you have so you can kind of tell how close you're getting to more time being added back to your health and what's the max health you can get i think it's it's only uh 999 so it, it's not not, it's not a lot it, which is i think that equates to uh like nine 999 is like 99 seconds or something like that it's like milliseconds it's like that yeah time. it's like that fast or yeah this right? track the 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 timer moves very very rapidly so it's, right. it's it's pretty pretty crazy so i guess the way to think about it is if you play the game really well if you play a level really well mm-hmm. uh you get time added back on for beating the level. So if you play well, you can kind of get into this... This, this groove this, of... Yeah, this yeah. groove where like you can take a little extra hits. Uh, you can maybe um, have a little bit more troubled spots and still make it through. Maybe okay. just avoid enemies so you don't even have to collect the, the power-ups and stuff. Right, but if you play poorly, it takes a lot to really dig yourself out of that hole, if it's even possible, because you know the levels take a certain amount of time. It takes a certain amount of time to rack up more kills to gain more time so you can dig yourself a a pretty nasty ditch really quickly in this game right so uh the control system of the game the game spans across 10 different levels and is entirely controlled with the mouse you know for a pc game it's not so bad actually Mm -hmm. it's it's kind of nice in fact i think on a d-pad this would be kind of brutal yeah Um, it'd feel too awkward in in like all over the place, but having a mouse to kind of move around actually felt the most natural. Even I was running through an emulator and it felt great. Yeah, and it makes the the shooting and all that stuff pretty intuitive. Yeah, really natural. You can continuously hold down like the the left click and uh, single shots will fire almost like a rapid fire. And so you can kind of hold that down as you're going through a succession of enemies mm-hmm. and just kind of kill one after the other. Kind of nice. And 
if I'm going to be using the mouse, I don't want to sit there and like. Yeah, you know, I mean that's, I, that's pretty that's, rough on your wrist. And... Yeah, so it is kind of nice. And then the uh, right click is the um, your your kind of secondary sub weapon, and you can choose from a bunch of different sub weapons at the beginning of each stage. There's stuff that you can equip like the SBC, which is like this rapid fire weapon, different rockets, homing missiles, and uh, there there's this bomb that basically kills everything on the screen, including bosses. Right. But so you it, think, wow, great, this is awesome. <laughs> Except uh, the weapon does like damage to you too. Yeah. It's like 500, 600 health. So unless you're like maxed out, right. like you almost never want to use that. Well, right? even if you are maxed out, so it, by beating the level, say you use it on the boss and you're at, for some reason, you get a, a power up, uh, a health drop or whatever. So you're, you're, so maxed you're at perfect out. health. Yeah. yeah. And you use it, you're going to be all the way down to maybe, you know, 300 health at most. And then you're going to get your your health added back on for being the level. You're still going to be starting at a pretty low deficit, so it may not even be good to use at all. Yeah. So if you have to use it, it's it's probably not good news. So there is some there is some stuff about the uh, the levels too. So like the first, I think what six levels mm-hmm. are you, you can kind of continue back from the last level if you right, die, you right? Die. But the the last what the last three or four? Yeah, seven, eight, nine, and ten. If you get killed. You revert all the way back to six. Why? Right. I don't even know. Yeah, that's. I mean, that had to be intentional. Yeah, um, the game itself plays pretty well. Not mm-hmm. not a lot of lag. Not a lot of slowdown. Everything seems pretty nice and snappy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I said, I'm running it through an emulator, and so are you. Everything seems fine. Emulator usually emulates those right. you know deficiencies in in games. So uh, I I'd have to say it's it's probably pretty good. It. I was looking at a few different review sites, um, like Japanese review sites, and everybody seemed that seemed to like the game a lot. Yeah, they otherwise. said it, everyone said it played well. There wasn't really any lag uh, or slowdown or anything like that. You know, we were talking about like Afterburner and stuff like that. it's not as pretty mm-hmm. as some of those. It's a little uglier, but um, it's definitely it's definitely worth a play. Yeah, and I would I would search some uh, images of it. I think the uh, the way that all the the things are laid out on the screen is is pretty funny. Um, yeah, we'll, I mean, we'll talk about that a, a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah when yeah. we get to the graphics section. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, the game itself is a must-play, and it's really because of the music. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's listen to some more music. Uh, the next track we have is Supersonic. That was Supersonic in Japanese, known as Koya or Wilderness, and this was composed by Casey now for Neural Gear. This track is extremely fast and rapid, so chaotic, many notes, very chaotic. Um, and I mean, there's just lots of transitions, lots of stereo panning. Uh, it, I mean, it lives up to that name of just being a flood of craziness, but it's still very well organized. Um, it's really beautiful and you know energetic, and it's just a really wild track. You, you know, um, again, I think his his balance between the the upper end and the the low end 
is is still just really awesome. I maybe that's just the sweet spot for me is mm -hmm. where the uh, I guess the high end is just a little bit more subdued. It's a little bit uh, it's it's not as overpowering, not as overbearing, and it kind of plays a secondary role even though it's the melody. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like that. You know, I, I, we hear that a lot with um, arcade games. For some reason, I don't know why. And the Sharp X68000 is really like the arcade PC. I mean, that's what, mm -hmm. you know, all the ports were basically arcade games and stuff like that. And so I, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I, I like that balance um, where you can, you know, amidst the chaos, you're still getting this just really cool melody uh, that you kind of have to, you kind of have to fish for. You kind of have to listen to and have more of a, like a closer sense with this track more i guess a tuned ear to it you have to yeah. really pay attention there's a lot to to go back and listen to over and over and over i think for the replayability i think that really helps out a lot for the, yeah. the songs i think so so next up we have a track called don't terry or subspace 2 and we'll be right back her Don't Terry, composed by Keishi Yonao for Neural Gear on the X68000. I I really, really like the bass on this one. It's mm -hmm. very nasty, very gritty. Uh, do you want to listen to that real quick? Yeah. Well, we just heard the track, but I, I gotta hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. I really like that. Is it you know I think his his patches are are incredible. Mm -hmm. I think this guy just has a, an awesome sense of what makes like a really good bass tone. Uh, bass tone, and uh, his other you know his other patches too are equally as awesome. But again, this you know I was talking about the balance in the last track. This one actually does kind of promote that that melody a little bit, mm -hmm. a little bit more than the other tracks. Well, and I think one of the reasons that it works with this one like that is like. So there's a, a very clear low end with like the drums and everything, and there's a very much more clear high end. Uh, but there's that middle range that if you listen to this track again, there's a lot going on that's very, very subtle that feels like it's kind of in between the two. Uh, and I liked that about this track because it, it gave me something new to kind of uh, like focus on. Right, something uh, to kind of latch onto. A little yeah. More. You know, there's one thing I want to bring up, and I don't know if this was 100% intentional. I can't imagine it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. um, but remember that track? I think it was Systematic Eyes. We hear that dun 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 dun. It mm -hmm. sounded very um, uh, like robotic, yeah, and mechanical. Very yeah, yeah, yeah. It, there's a, a very subtle kind of background that's kind of replaying that part. And I wonder if he's. He's coming back and and reusing that kind of theme in this one. So do you want to hear that real yeah, quick? Yeah, kind of maybe tie the tracks together into one soundtrack, I guess. Yeah, so we can find it here.
But you see what I mean? That's just like channel five and six, but it's kind of like that octave just kind of bouncing back and forth in your ear. Right. Uh, kind of like the systematic eyes. I think that's what it was. Yeah. Um, cool. Cool. But it does sound like a kind of a, like a replay on, on that theme, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like I said, I think that kind of falls into that middle-ish range of like a whole bunch of uh, sounds going on together, but they just work really well to kind of fit in there like a sandwich, I guess. Yeah. Well, let's get into another track. This is called Fluxion, which is also tied to Umi or Ocean in Japanese, composed by Keishi Onao for Neural Gear. That track was titled Fluxian, whatever that means, uh, composed by Keishi Anao for Nero Gear on the Sharp X68000. I thought this track was way laid back. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I loved the the drama and the emotion to this track. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it felt really cool to, compared to you know some of the other ones that are just chaotic and, and so much going on. This one still had notes all over the place, but it's it had this like um, like sad dramatic feel to it. You know, again, kind of going back to this thing that I, I keep saying about balance, you know, again, I think that um, the melody doesn't really punch any louder than anything else. Mm-hmm. But I think what does happen that makes this track kind of promote that that melody even more is that all the notes kind of dance around it. Mm-hmm. They kind of take turns. So when the melody plays a single note, the other notes kind of accompany it with like a response. So it's like this kind of back and forth kind of um, like emotional quality, like you were saying, to the track that uh, I really enjoy. I think it's a lot more. I mean, again, it, it's got a, a, a thousand notes per minute, mm-hmm. but it feels more laid back. Maybe that's because there's kind of like this give and take with right. that melody and rhythm section. Yeah, like they're they're sharing instead of uh, competing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, we kind of talked about the MT32. And uh, this, you know, the whole soundtrack has its equivalent for either MIDI or the OPM. Uh, we do have a track here, so we've heard Townscape already on the OPM. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a, a a version from the MT32. This is actually playing through a friend's SC88 Pro, which has like kind of a, a compatible MIDI output. Right. A little bit different, but I think the sound is really cool. So why don't we take a listen to that, and we'll be right back.
All right, that was the MIDI version of Townscape composed by Casio Now. And, uh, you know, this version, you know, the, the Sound Canvas 88 is kind of like the successor to the successor of the MT32. It's mm -hmm. um, kind of like the next generation. And it does a pretty good job at getting the same sound as the MT32. It's not exact, but it's pretty darn close. So what we're hearing is um, a pretty awesome rendition mm -hmm. of, uh, of the track. And I, I, I really like it. Yeah, I think the only thing that I, I didn't like or that I felt kind of distracting is there was that sound in there that kind of sounded like strumming an electric guitar that wasn't plugged in. Oh, uh, okay, okay, um, okay. And uh, it to me, it, it felt like everything else felt so smooth and kind of soft all going together. And that was just very kind of sharp sounding and, and it kind of, it stuck out to me and it, it I don't know, it felt, felt funny, but I did like the track. The later part of the track was just insane it was so good yeah there was like this otherworldly kind of sound in the background that was really cool <laughs> right right you know I, I it's it's a love-hate relationship with the midi stuff I, I guess it's not a love-hate it's it's a love but it's maybe just not as strong mm -hmm. as like the opm and um i feel like the sounds just aren't as even though they're they're meant to be more organic like real instrument sounding they always just sound a little bit faker to me anyway mm -hmm. and something like fm I, I know what I'm getting into. I know it's this, you know, generated waveform based on, you know, modulation and stuff. And so it's it's a totally different feel. But um, I can appreciate the MIDI oh, yeah. version a lot. I yeah, think it's really good. And I love that just sharp, punchy, chip tune, hard edge sound. Right. Uh, a lot. I mean, other people I could see like that that uh, maybe came into games later or are really into like other modern forms of music might like something a little softer, more realistic sounding. But Right. You don't get as much uh, of the grit to the bass yeah. in this version. Now, that being said, though, there are some things that I actually prefer in MIDI. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of like old American DOS games that just sound incredible on through the MT32. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, still, still sound good in like OPL2 or something, but like the MIDI version is just where it's at. Like the Monkey Island theme, like I, I, <laughs> I hate to use that as like the example because there's more than that, but like it just sounds so flippin' incredible. Yeah. Where, you know, I, I think that this could go either way. I can see uh, it being pretty awesome having two versions of the soundtrack though. Anyway, so we talked about the gameplay. Uh, we're kind of mentioning the graphics, so I think it's a good time to bring that up. I think the game yeah. looks it looks fairly good. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it, the hand-drawn animations are, are probably the best part. Yeah, I mean, this game, like we talked about, it's not as insane as like Space Hair or something like that, but it's still a really good-looking game. Uh, I did have to kind of laugh a little bit when I saw how large oh, yeah, everything, yeah. all the uh, um, like counters like your and HUD, score. Right? Yeah, your HUD is so incredibly big. Um, like you have this hit counter that this takes up so much space. I mean, the, the way that to look at it is your health timer in the top corner is like a third square of the screen. Yeah, so it yeah. takes up kind of like a third down and a third to the right. Uh, so that's, that alone is huge. It's um, almost, it's almost like quarter of the screen, man. It's pretty big. Yeah. It does allow enemies to overlap it, which is kind of neat. It's kind of neat to, so that, uh, some of the enemies can overlap the, the timer in the background and like your health or whatever. Uh, but the score at the bottom takes up so much space as well i mean it's it comes up for about uh, a quarter of the screen and it says hit counter really really big there's no reason it needs to be that big no and then it has a giant like digital hit counter um and so what it does though it is it, it really gets in the way of the character's movement yeah, or, the, or vertical movement. yeah the vertical yeah. movement you kind of have this little like slice to slide around in which I guess maybe yeah because your character cannot overlap the hit count right? right that's where you stop so your your actual field of view appears bigger than it is because you really only got like this tiny little margin mm -hmm. right? yeah all the, like the hit counter your score all that stuff it uh, it doesn't have like a background to it so the sky things are transitioning through it the ground um, but yeah you're kind of stuck in that middle strip the middle third of the screen just going basically oh. left and right to and avoid then things. slightly uh, horizontal or slightly vertical yeah yeah so. um, but I mean I, from a design standpoint, I think it could be kind of cool. I didn't expect it when I was looking at it. Yeah. Um, I, I really don't like the score counter font. Like it has this kind of gradient to it that just seems out of place. But other than that, <laughs> like the game looks good. The, the the graphics, the background, some of the cutscenes, they look really, really cool. Yeah. I think the uh, the intro too is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. You got um, Emmy in that, that 
mask it's almost kind of like the oh, samus yeah. mask and you see like the stuff flashing and mm-hmm. her eyes are like all like big and like animated out and i i really like that i think that's that's pretty awesome um overall you know the, the, we said the graphics they don't really compare to some of the other games at the time we're doing the same kind of thing but it still looks pretty good it looks pretty clean it's very playable today i think yeah there's no reason not to play it. it's not um even like we mentioned before with uh, the frustration of dying some of the bosses towards the end are kind of unfair too but it doesn't really take away from how fun this game can be yeah so let's get into another track this is called wake up everybody composed by casey on now track was titled wake up everybody in japanese known as sora or sky composed by keishi now i thought this track was pretty good it's not not my favorite one it's it has a really long repetitive section in the beginning in the beginning right yeah uh and i don't know maybe when it like when the high end comes in it kind of wakes you up so maybe that like it puts you to sleep in the beginning and then you're like whoa here comes the high end and it gets pretty cool but it's still relatively short and simple by comparison to some of his other tracks really the star of this track is the bass line yeah it's really really good the track itself eh, it's all right it's okay i wasn't i mean we've heard so many amazing tracks so far yeah. and we got a lot more to go that um yeah it's probably yeah mid-range for me i wouldn't say it i wouldn't say i dislike it at all oh of course not. Uh, yeah. but you know eh, not a lot to say let's move on to the next track well the next one should be a good one because it's called come to a climax and we'll be right back heard come to a climax or subspace three composed by keishi Now for neural gear on the x68000 I, I you know I, I like this one a lot but i wouldn't say it did any it really didn't go anywhere right. um however i still think there's a lot of power in this track and a mm-hmm. lot of good stuff that came out of it yeah i love the way that this one kind of um ramped up in a different way than some of the other tracks a lot of times we would hear more notes come in, like more instruments come in with different notes. Uh, this time we, we heard more instruments come in with the same notes and it just right. kind of the same thing built up. It kind of layered on top yeah, of each other. And it yeah. was, I thought that was really cool. Now it did make it feel slightly repetitive. It was exciting to feel like more and more and more like it's building and building to a climax. And um, man, those cymbal crashes were super hard like they were <laughs> yeah. like i would yeah it was it was crazy how heavy those were but it was really cool yeah very cool you know this we got to kind of refocus you know this is a shooter right. technically and i think this track really does a great job of kind of giving you that like that action sequence mm-hmm. um the whole way through even though you know the, the there's repetition and stuff in there 
you're supposed to be focusing on the gameplay in front of you, and this right. is meant to be this just like intense background sound, and I think that uh, he pulls it off in mm-hmm. every which way. So, yeah. Anyways, really excited. We've been kind of waiting for the whole episode to talk to uh, Mr. Yanal, and um, now is our chance. So we want to say, Yanal son, thanks for spending time today with us. Uh, to kind of chat about your career and your composition, we're talking about Neural Gear today. So hopefully you can provide some info for us. <laughs> yeah, of course. Ah, uh, man, it's been quite a while, though. Yeah, even for that late release soundtrack. Yeah. All right. So first off, how did you actually make your way into the game industry? Where did you get your start? Uh, well, when I first started off, I was responsible for a game on the MSX. Maybe it was the MSX2 at a small company called Hertz. That was in Shinjuku. Well, it's no longer there. That would have been like 1990, 1989, I think. But yeah, that was my first debut. What, 30 or 29 years ago? I'd have to quickly check on that. <laughs> was that Hyde Fos? Oh, Hyde Fos. それが最初です。きっかけはね、あの僕の中学時代のあのなんだ同級生がプログラマーをしてましてこの会社でそこでちょっと音楽作らせてもらえないかなって紹介してもらったのがそのヘルツって会社でした。but one of the programmers at the company was actually my classmate from junior high school. And so he introduced me to the company Hertz and was like, do you think you might be able to do some music for us? So you were in, you were in high school at the time? I think that would have been high school or uh, no, I was 19. Uh, so how did you end up moving over to work for Fill In Cafe? Fill In Cafe. Fill In Cafe. That's right. So Filling Cafe had done a game called Metal Sight. その<笑>その方にあの紹介してもらって、で、あのあのプログラマーの人にえっとね。So I was introduced by that programmer, Izuru Aki, uh, and he was composing at the time. I don't know if he's still doing it or not. But then uh, I was introduced to a programmer called Takumi Amano. And he was a member of Filling Cafe. いわゆるなんだ、あの実業家。はい。こういう人もべっと知り合って、えっと、なんだろう、その人はゲームを作ってはいなかったんだけど、その3人が集まってできたのがフィルインカフェで、チームだったんです。There was another guy, Konya, uh, more of an investor, and so the three of them kind of created this company together. うん、そっから僕もチームにいたんだけど、会社にしますっていうことで、僕はあの会社員にはならず。when they became an official company, I remained on the team, but not really as like an employee of the company. Ah, uh, okay. So more of like a contractor than an actual fill-in cafe employee. So what was the team dynamic like there? どんどんあの発展していってやることもどんどん新しくなったし、あの仲間もね、あのそんなにまだ付き合いの深い仲間でなかったから、いろんなことができるよねっていうことでモチベーションすごく高くて楽しかった記憶。Oh, it was great. Tech was improving, so there was a lot of things we can kind of learn together as we went. None of us were really that close to each other yet, so our motivation was still pretty high. You know, we we're still kind of bouncing ideas off of each other. It was really fun. Awesome. 
Mm-hmm. Kind of circling back to your composition, what was the main source of your inspiration? あの、載せてもらう時に答えているのは、えっと、バッハとジェイスバッハと言います。バッハとあとえ、アースウィンドアンドファイアです。BWF です。はい。と、えっと、芸能山城組とありますね。日本人なんです。この辺が割と好きで
っと戦ってるところが両立するような感じで工夫したような記憶がありますはいうん But look, it's a shooting game. So, with that gentle image, how can I say this? I guess even though there's fighting, I try to kind of create a compatible feeling between you know, both the fighting and that, that kind of subtle gentleness. I think, that's, I think that worked out in this track. I think it's really cool how、uh, that was something that was in mind, too a beautiful, snowy scene and violence. Yeah, so you hear that twinkling sound in the beginning there. この音はそ,のそういうなんか氷とかそういうあのなんでしょうあの硬いというか冷たいイメージをちょっと出すためにそういう音を MT3 人の方からちょっと作品に選んできてそれを F 音源でも同じようにやってみた記憶があります。So yeah, that tone was supposed to represent ice or invoke some kind of cold image. I originally chose the tones on the MT32 and then kind of recreated them on the FM chip. <laughs> it's, I don't know, it's like、uh, reassuring to be right. I mean,、yeah. That's the feeling that we got, and I'm sure it's reassuring for you as well. To, that's the feeling you wanted, and that's the feeling you got, even all these years later. Oh, we were actually going to ask that next, too, whether the MT32 version was done first or the OPM. That was actually one of the questions from one of our friends, Electric Boogaloo, that he was curious about. Yeah. So, this is the first time that the FMO Ongen version was done. It's a lot of FMO Ongen is going to be a lot of FMO Ongen. Yeah, that's right. I started with the MT32 and did the FM version after that. Well, even while doing the MIDI version, I was still keeping things under consideration for the FM version as well. That makes sense. So, what was your composing process? ね、well, I've changed a lot since then, but at that time, I kind of start with a rhythm section, which was usually like this short loop, and then after that, I kind of tack on a melody on top. Well, actually, I guess now I'd usually start with a melody.、Mm. Oh, okay, that's, that's really interesting to hear, like not only、mm. the process, but how. It's really changed so much over all these years. Yeah, it's taken like a complete 180 from his original composing kind of techniques. So,、uh, tell us about the software you used to create the soundtrack. ヘルツで、あのー、知り合ったあのプログラマーさんが作ってくれたドライバーを使ってたような気がします。At that time, hmm, where was I? It wasn't System Sacom. Oh, that's right, it was Victor. So, the company I was talking about earlier, where I got my debut, Hertz. At Hertz, I was using a sound driver made for me by the programmer. I don't really clearly remember like, how it, I used it, but it was, it was challenging.、Uh, that was the FM chip driver. はい。だったんじゃないかな。ちょっと、はっきりしたことは覚えてないです。おそらく。あの、エモンゲンドライバー、あの、そのヘルツでも6万8000のゲームを作ってたんですよ。で、曲も書かせてもらって、その時に、やっぱり自社でドライバーを作ってて、そのドライバーをお借りしたって記憶します。So, Hertz was also making games for the X68000 and had me do some of their music. So, the driver they created, I used to create the music for Filling Cafe as well. Okay, interesting. So, to build on to that, speaking more in terms of the software and hardware used during the compositional phase, could you tell us a little bit more about that? So, this is what I'm saying. I'm going to tell you about the music pro. あのソフトがミュージックプロのソフトがあってで、えっと、ミディ版のミュージックプロっていうのが当時あってすでに MT32 をつなげてそれであの楽譜で入力するソフトなんですけどそれで作ってましたはい。Oh, that's right.、Uh, the software that came on our dev X68000 was, I believe, called Music Pro.、Uh, at that time, we were using the MIDI version of the software. So we connect the actual MT32 up, and with the software, we could directly enter the tones that I, you know, I wanted to put in. It was just like a score. 
それをあのメディデータっていうのをこう抽出して、そのメディデータをもう一回ドライバー用にこうちょっと手作業とかいろいろなんでフィルタリングしながらデータをこう変えて、なんでしょう、コンバートして、それであの曲あのゲームの中のデータにしてました。So anyways, Uh, that would produce the MIDI data. However, it didn't automatically work with the driver, so I had to do my own filtering and tweaking to kind of convert it to finally work into the game. Awesome. So tell us about your experience with the YM2151 and kind of the interesting points or kind of shortcomings that you had to deal with. で、ADPCM は、えっ、ー、と、一音だけなんですけど、まあそういう意味じゃ、その、ゲームの中の効果もその ADPCM でやるんで、その、まあなんでしょうね、あの、演奏よりも効果音の方が優先されるんで、その演奏、効果音で演奏が聞け,聞けされるみたいなところがあったんで、そこはちょっとどうしていいのか、ね、当時もちょっと悩みどころでしたけど、まあそのゲーム、ゲームの中の演出なんで、そんなに目立たなかった部分も結構あったのかなと。So at that time, you know, using the YM2151, we only had eight voices or channels to work with, and only one channel for PCM on the OK chip. And because sound effects were more of a focus, took more of precedence over the music, they'd kind of take over a channel. So I really struggled to be creative with my usage. But even if the music wasn't the main focus, I did what I could to make it as enjoyable as possible. FM 音源とかあの別のマシンで X1 ターボっていうあとシャープの,あのパソコンがあってそれで YM2151 は触ってたんですけどその時はその時はまあ ADPCM なかったんでその ADPCM 書いたってだけで全然違う感じ、まあ、ドラムとかねそういうのをすごく ADPCM できるっていうだけでもすごくサウンドがこう豪華に。Until then, I was using a Sharp X1 Turbo to create the patches for FM, and it didn't have an ADPCM attached. So, when we finally did hear stuff back on the Sharp X68000 with the Oki chip, like the drum samples and stuff, it was really, really impressive, and working with the sound hardware was a lot of fun. Oh, that's really good to hear. Yeah.、Uh, all those. Challenges and struggles,、uh, but still being fun at the same time, I think is, is something really cool. And very interesting, too, using a Sharp X1 Turbo, which was kind of like the、uh, it, like a newer model of the Sharp X1 that included, I think it included the 2151. That's, that's really cool to be able to、uh, to rate the FM and then kind of moving it over to the system and then getting like this free channel with it. Like,、yeah. oh man, it sounds so cool. I didn't know it was going to sound like that. Yeah. Now, we're always curious about limitations and then also with composers that move on to more modern stuff. And you've done a lot of modern scores as well. How would you compare writing music back then as opposed to writing music for today? So, Hmm, yeah, I mean, really, when you have a specific internal sound source that you have to work with, I think there's quite a limitation in how you can express yourself in the music. And for the tones, too, we didn't have any presets or anything like that. And there wasn't like much music sharing or sharing samples or patches at that time. So basically, you just kind of had to make them yourself. Right. And that was really hard. So, really, the time consuming part wasn't the composition, it was the tone creation. Nowadays, there's so many options and so many pre made effects to choose from that you can't even listen to them all. So much has changed since then. Yeah, that, that's the crazy thing about the internet is now everything is so readily available and shared. Yep. Whether、yeah. it's intentionally shared or not. I mean, a lot of the music that we listen to on the show, you know, is、mm-hmm. like it's because we have access to it now and we wouldn't have been able to really do this show. Like, 15 years ago or、yeah. 20 years ago, you know? Anyways, lastly, what projects are you working on these days? 
、インマン、現在だと、そういう言い方で言うと、あのゲームもいくつか関わってますし、アニメも、引き続きやるアニメの仕事もありますし、っていうのとか、で、アニメは DS 入れて、去年あのアニメになった、えっ、ー、と、テレビアニメになったんですけど、今度はあの配信される、続編が配信されるんですけど、その、あの、なんでしょう。PV、新しい PV 用の曲を作ったりとか、その後もなんかあの企画があるらしくて、いろいろまたやらせてもらうことにはなってますから、DS 入れっていうあのゲームが完璧化されたものです。So I'm continuing to work on games and also continuing music for anime. For anime, I'm working on the music for DS e Day,、uh, which was released as an anime last year. Originally started as a game. We had talked about that before.、Mm-hmm. And I'm working on the follow up anime for that. At this moment, I'm working on music for the promotional video for the anime, but I'm also going to be part of the team that's doing the soundtrack for the actual anime, which is due out in July. Oh, awesome. I love to see a game to anime to, you know, just continuous working it, on it. It's going to be it, cool. And it's cool because a lot of the anime soundtracks like, really have a like, video game music vibe to them, right?、So、yeah. There's a lot of overlap, I think, there. All right,、uh, Yonel san, thank you so much again for shedding some light on your compositional history and your career. Thank you so much. Uh, we're really looking forward to your fruit, your releases, and maybe getting you on the show again to talk about like Asuka 120 Burning Fest or something. Yeah, you know, so many、awesome. other games, too.、Um, thank you so much. Awesome. That was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. A lot of great information, dude. Yeah. And some stuff that we unfortunately aren't able to share yet. <laughs> yeah. So,、uh, yeah, there's a, a part on、uh, towards the end of the interview, he's talking about his games. We're going to have to cut that from the episode, maybe. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll see if it's actually,、uh, there's a press release on it or not. Yeah, I'll、we'll、have、um, to do a little bit of research, but、uh, <laughs> yeah. it's great to hear that he's continuously working in not only just games, but in anime as well,、uh, which is a, you know, a never ending career. So that's, that's awesome. Anyways, let's get into another track. This is called Time Spirit. This is the ending track of the game composed by Mr. Keishi Yonao. You just heard Time Spirit composed by Keishi Yonao for Neural Gear on the X68000. Wow, what a great track! Yeah, very、oh. different.、Uh, yeah. It was、uh, extremely laid back. It wasn't crazy notes all over the place, but so good,、uh, so emotional. It feels very much like an ending、uh, credits you know, type, tr- type track that's you know, heroic. Uh, but exhausted, catching your breath, and kind of just a sigh of relief. Yeah, I like that sigh of relief. It does kind of have that, that feeling. It's like everything's winding down and just, man, let it all go.、Mm-hmm. You've done it. Like, game over kind of thing. I, I love this track. I think it's the perfect way to not only end the game, but end our show.、Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just very 
uplifting and it's just got all those awesome earmarks of what make it yeah. a, a great ending track. And it's funny, it made me think about, uh, so with the story, uh, she is tasked with moving backwards throughout time to help save the future, I guess. So okay, I, like I, I, didn't, I like where this is going. I didn't beat the game, so I wonder... Does she get stuck in the past, or does she get to come back? I don't know. Like, nah, like she just keeps going back. But maybe it's a better time back there. I don't know. Maybe it's a simpler time <laughs> before World War Four. <laughs> before World War One, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, it reminds me of that that high end. It, it, I, I don't know if it's like approximating a saxophone. The MT32 version doesn't really sound that way. Uh, but I like. Uh, I really like the the imagery that I get because it's. You know Lionel Richie? Mm-hmm. You know back when he had like the the uh, the mullet mm-hmm. that was like all curly and like down his back. Imagine him playing saxophone and just like wearing this nice blue suit and <laughs> yeah. and just like everything just feels right. Yeah, um, almost like the Mac at Night kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> Mac at Night. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was a really cool track. Um, excellent composer. Awesome time talking with him today. Yeah. I'm super stoked that uh, uh, you know. We got to hear about his history and kind of the details about the game and his composition. Yeah. I mean, how lucky are we? We started this show years ago, and now we get to talk to you composers that were just, you know, you get know, the geek out on. Yeah, totally. And, you know, uh, some f- composers that we remember from our childhood, some, you know, that we are just discovering. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's a really, you know, I think the show is great because it's a lot of um, discovery for us and uh, hopefully for you guys, a lot of history uh, behind it and something we can kind of appreciate is like this artifact of uh, our past, our recent past, because yeah. this is, you know, around when all of us were alive. Yeah, the unsung heroes of video games, the composers. Big time. Anyway, so today we covered Neural Gear on the Sharp X68000, composed by Keishi Yonao. If you want to know more about the show, you can check us out online at pixelatedaudio.com for show notes and track lists. We can also be found on Twitter and other social media, at Pixelated Audio. And don't forget to join our Discord. Yep. Discord's very active. Mm-hmm. You know, you can get technical at times. You can get just very laid back. We play games in there. It's, it's a lot of fun. Find a lot of new music. Everyone's posting different tracks to try out. It's Big really time. cool. Big time. Uh, if you like our show, uh, please leave a comment on iTunes. It's very easy if you're using the podcast app. You can go in there and give us a review. Mm-hmm. Uh, only takes a second. Uh, if you want to just email us directly, that's awesome. We also have a Patreon. If you want to support the show, you like what we're doing, uh, you know, by all means, you know, feel free to uh, become a patron and um, throw a few dollars our way. That means a lot to us. Yeah. And if you're new to the show, we have quite a list of backlogged uh, episodes. Right. Um, recently, we did Big Bang Pro Wrestling on the Neo Geo Pocket Color, which we've been wanting to do for a long time anyway. Yeah. We love that system. But we did some uh, more of modern episode with uh, Tetris DS. So we did right, Ninja, right, right, right. Nintendo DS. Um, so many other stuff. Wonder Boy 3 is just another one that's recent. All right. So in our last episode, you asked me uh, to think of like a s- episode that just came off the top of your head. Uh-huh. How, about, how about you this time? Ah, uh, let's see. I really enjoyed. Um, uh, I've been seeing a lot of people play Genesis a lot lately, so I'm gonna say Restar was a fun one for me. Okay, all right. I'm gonna say. I want to say Ghost in the Shell because oh, it's been a long time, and I and, 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 and I mentioned Ghost in the Shell earlier on the show. So Ghost in the Shell, I don't remember what episode that was. It's got to be in like the 30s or something. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Yeah, a long we're, time ago. We're definitely due for some more PlayStation. Yeah. That being said, I hope you guys uh, enjoy the show and you uh, check back in a few weeks for the next episode. This one was a little bit delayed, again, because we wanted to make sure uh, Keishio now had adequate time to to be on. Mm -hmm. And we want to thank him very much for uh, sharing his thoughts with us today. Thank you guys again so much for listening. And we'll see you back in a few weeks for the next episode. Thank you.
今リ、フェスリリースしてるかどうかだけちょっとチェックしてもらって、それはあの情報が出せるかどうか、僕、今ちょっとわからないので、一旦それ、プレスリリースがなければ、あの秘密にしておいてもらって。Uh, I have no idea if they've done a press release or not, so make sure you check before you post this information online. 